Welcome, I'm Michael Hart. I'll be your presenter for this professional development series regarding dyslexia and ADHD. This is module nine. In this module, we're gonna talk about the basic accommodations for dyslexic children in your classroom. Now, here is how we meet the challenge with accommodations. Accommodations serve as a way for dyslexic kids to bypass their weakest channels, bypassing their basic reading skills, bypassing their written language skills, so that they can express their true abilities and their true development uh, for understanding and producing. So it's a way for them to be able to leverage their strengths and bypass their weaknesses so they can be more uh, age appropriate in their academic development predicated on their intellectual capabilities. Now, I wanted to take you back for a moment to talk about this study that is frankly still ongoing with Sally Shaywitz. Uh, you remember that I discussed previously the whole idea that this incredible gap starts occurring very, very quickly in, in uh, academic years. Uh, for dyslexic kids versus non-dyslexic people. So this is a study that's been going on for 28 years so far. And there are two groups. One is a group of uh, non-dyslexics, and one, the other group, is a group of dyslexics. And what Sally and her team have done is they're quite aware of what these IQ levels are for these two different groups, and they pair that with the reading behaviors that they're seeing in those people that are in this study. So as you can see on the left, those who do not have dyslexia pretty much map their intellectual capabilities with regard to how much they read as they move up through school and into adulthood, as a matter of fact. Now on the right, you can see very, very quickly that the gap gets larger and larger and larger. So when we think about accommodations, we're thinking about what are some of the ways that we can use technology and use other accommodations in the classroom to decrease that gap as much as we possibly can, because that has a profound impact, not only while the child's in school, but also profoundly impacts their life as a whole. Now, I found this beautiful quote I wanted to share with you. It's, uh, it was embedded in a document that's going to be available to you in the bibliography. It was written by the Texas Education Agency. And that's basically a part of the Board of Education for the state of Texas. And it specifically discusses how to best, what are best practices with regard to technology integration for students with dyslexia. So the important point here, I think, is that number one, it's a beautiful model for those of you out there who are looking for a model. And secondly, it makes clear that uh, assistive technology and instructional accommodations need to be provided in conjunction with other learning strategies and whatever targeted reading instructions in, in place. So it's not, it's not an either or, it's both. And we need both of that in order to support our students as best we can so that they can try to do their best in keeping up with their uh, grade level work uh, predicated on their capabilities, the true capabilities. That's a beautiful quote. Now, can I keep it high level? Three basic types of accommodations. First, we're gonna talk about audiobooks, and then we're going to talk about some other compensatory assistive technologies that I think uh, are becoming increasingly more prevalent, but still it's, a, uh, I think it's a great, it's a great kind of an organizing way to think about how to integrate them into your classroom. And then at the end, I'm going to talk a little bit about, you know, some non-tech based type supports like additional time. So before we get into that, I want to make a brief comment on applications and software and operating systems. Nowadays, in January of 2015, there is an awful lot available to you 
just through your operating software. So what I would propose you do is find out what your platform can do now. And I'm talking about both Apple and Microsoft. They both have the ability, and you know a lot about, uh, certainly autocorrect is a very common one that's known well, spelling and grammar check, of course. But we're also seeing the beginnings of a lot of speech to text, text capability speech recognition capability, obviously, Siri being one of the most obvious, and the ability to really integrate the thesaurus into um, the, oh, whatever you're using uh, for word product, for word content uh, development like Word or, or whatever it is the corollary is for Apple. So what I'm suggesting is that you take a look at what your computer can do now or your laptop or your your tablet what can it do now or your phone just in and of itself with this operating system then you can think about plugging in applications now certainly there's a lot of free apps out there but i think just saving time and money knowing what your machine can do on the most basic operating software level is um, uh, can be potentially very very helpful for you now talk about audiobooks in a minute then we're going to talk a little bit about the difference between audiobooks and text-to-speech apps. And then we're going to discuss speech-to-text. We've already kind of mentioned that with regard to operating systems. And I've included mind mapping and vocabulary as two really important applications that add a lot of value for our dyslexic kids in terms of accommodating their weaknesses in for instance, creating written output and developing a vocabulary. Now, with regard to audiobooks, I'm going to use LearningAlly.org as a model. Learning Ally is a national nonprofit organization that provides services for dyslexic kids and other kids who have visual problems. In fact, originally the company was all about providing audiobooks for the blind, and then so many people with dyslexic students and dyslexic children contacted them and asked for their audiobooks as an adjunct to what the kids were using in school. And now they're primarily a, a nonprofit organization that supports dyslexic kids. Now there's great value in their products in several different ways. Here's, here's four. There are human, there are over 80,000 titles now growing constantly every day in their database. Many of those titles include those books that are being used in the K through 12 schools as well as higher ed. Now the beauty of this is that they're human narrated audio textbooks and literature. So it makes it much, much easier for dyslexic kids to listen to because the synthetic digital voice is oftentimes very difficult to listen to. And when you have a synthetic digital voice, you lose that ability to model effective fluency, expression, and prosody, which prosody, prosody just means you know patterns of rhythm and sound. So it's in other words, it's cadence, volume, pacing, that whole kind of a process of reading. Now, so that's number one. Number two, this company has the ability to highlight words as students read. So not only does it reinforce word identification, but it really helps them with their decoding skill development or their sounding out word development. Essentially what you're seeing here is that we're opening up an opportunity to use multi-sensory tools that are going to allow the child to use different neural pathways so that there's a greater likelihood that they're going to be able to process this information and then embed that in their memory so that they can make use of it and it becomes something that is kind of part of their basic database, so to speak. So it really is you know, critical skill development, quite frankly. You know, it, it supports the growth of their background knowledge so that they can build a database uh, it's very important for, for vocabulary development. And of course, that leads to the ultimate goal of reading, which is uh, comprehension and it improves their ability to comprehend. And finally, 
listening to audiobooks for a lot of kids is fun. First of all, they get to enjoy age-appropriate titles, right? They get to enjoy texts that are of interest and developmentally appropriate for them. And one of the issues you have with dyslexic children is that if they have really delayed reading, it's quite hard to find content that is of interest to them that's developmentally and socially and emotionally appropriate because the text is so much lower level than the other kids or their age. So it's it's uh, it can be mo really motivating because it's so extraordinary for the child to be able to finally you know keep up and they're finally able to have this other avenue in their brain employed so that they can listen and understand the stories and begin to to build much better uh, uh, comprehension capabilities. So it's engaging, it's motivating, it's fun, it's stimulating, and it's just uh, it's just a, a really wonderful way for the kids to to help them stay on track. Now, let's talk about the benefits of text to speech. What that means is we're highlighting a big chunk of text, and that text is then being converted to uh, uh, to a speech. Now. It's uh, another bridge to better learning through multisensory exposure. Uh, and I've given you an example here of a, of a software or app that is available that uh, works pretty well and is highly reviewed, or high, well reviewed, rather, I should say. But I want to make a, a point here now. This is kind of an interim step because it, when you train your app or your software on a chunk of content, it's going to be able to pick up on the content. It's going to be able to read it to you. However, it does not pick up on graphics or other kind of, well, basically graphics. So, for instance, if you have a mathematical equation on the page, it's not going to be able to pick it up. Not like in an audio book where you're going to be able to actually have that equation read to you so that it's understandable. So any graphics, any pictures, any kind of boxes on the page that aren't text driven or aren't text based are not going to get picked up by these text to speech kinds of applications. So of value, yes, perfect, no. But of course, we don't have every book in the universe in some kind of an audiobook format. So um, this can be a very useful tool. As you can see, this particular tool you can highlight a word, you can get a definition for it, you can bookmark it if you want to come back to it, and, uh, and you can also highlight it as well if it's, if it's an important piece of content that you want to come back to while you're studying. Now let's go to the benefits of speech to text. Now this, in my professional opinion, is probably the most powerful tech tool that has ever been developed for dyslexic kids particularly those dyslexic kids that are highly verbal. This removes so many obstacles. Now, of course, there is a bit of a learning curve because they need to be able to dictate to the uh, computer or the tablet or the phone, and they need to be able to understand how they, how they uh, can, how they need to speak. Uh, they got to understand how to use the punctuation and paragraph and other grammatical types of commands. Like for instance, if I were to say uh, benefits of speech to text, first bullet, probably the most powerful tech tool for dyslexics, blah, 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 next bullet. That's the kind of uh, training that these kids need, but it's becoming easier and easier and easier for that to happen. Now, I'm sure many of you've heard about Dragon Software. That is really state-of-the-art in terms of uh, speech-to-text software, and there are many different versions. There's a home version that's quite affordable, and there's uh, the best reviews that you can get on the web are generally for Dragon. Now, uh, having said that, as I mentioned earlier, uh, Apple especially has embedded in their operating system many of the features and functionality that you find with Dragon. So you may be able to, just by virtue of having an iPad or 
um, a, a Mac uh, computer that you're going to have uh, the opportunity to make use of speech to text just by the features and functionality embedded in your operating system. So it really behooves you to, to see what you have in your classroom and see what's available for the kids. Now, another component that I've included in here is mind mapping. Um, if you think about it with dyslexic kids, uh, just the written task, any kind of a written task is incredibly difficult for them. So this is a new kind of digital tool that is, again, engaging and can be very fun for the kids, and it's very simple. So it's anywhere from just, you know, brainstorming. And, of course, you know, they can use, um, uh, they can use uh, audio commands or speech to text on this. And they can, you know, capture their ideas, capture their concepts. Uh, they can organize those. They have a place where they can go back and recall them. And it's so much easier for them to do it this way and have a visual representation because once again, we're employing specific types of neural pathways in order for the child to be able to really develop their skill ability in the idea of planning and uh, creating content that is organized and communicates well. So it's another simple very inexpensive tool. There's a number of very there's a number of very good um, software tools that are free, and they increase the probability that a child's going to be able to create a ultimately a written product or maybe a multimedia product. Quite frankly, that is going to be much more closely related to their actual capabilities. Now, you can see so many times these very, very verbal, very, very bright kids, their handwriting is, frankly, atrocious. And so this is a wonderful way for them to be able to, to kind of do an end around and bypass that particular choke point or um, problem area for their uh, output. And it's a wonderful way for them, too, to try to map what they're doing when they're reading. Now, I included the benefits of vocabulary apps because, as you saw in that earlier slide in Sally Shaywitz's study, that reduced vocabulary development is a very, very significant issue. And if you're a slow, difficult reader, you're not going to enjoy it. And so that's going to significantly impact your vocabulary development over time. And so now with these uh, wonderful apps where, you know, you can embed this kind of vocabulary development in games, you can create digital flashcards, you can, uh, there's just a myriad of ways that we can engage the child so that, as the research says, they need to be exposed about 12 times at least in order for them to really start to get uh, what those vocabulary words are and what they mean. So now what we're doing basically is just using technology to engage the students. And this is a very, it's a fun thing for you to do in the classroom. And it's also a wonderful gift to the children who really need to continue to develop their vocabulary and try to keep up with their age mates and their classmates. Now, let me just make a few comments here on uh, providing additional time and other accommodations. In your bibliography, there's going to be probably one of the most useful, useful resource that so far I've been able to provide you. So I'm going to show you in the bibliography a checklist of modifications and accommodations that probably includes 150 different types of modifications and accommodations that you may be able to use in the classroom. And it's a very, very clean, quick, and simple way to think about a particular student and tic-tac through this list and determine what's reasonable and possible for you to be able to provide them in the classroom during your time working with this child. And of course, I put up some of the largest or most frequently used accommodations. For instance, just providing additional time for any projects 
tasks or written work that needs to be done. Extra response time really actually refers to those kids who have processing issues, language processing issues, so that if you call on them in the classroom, you're aware by virtue of what you know about how their brain is wired, that you've got to be a little bit more patient, give them time, but they probably with time will be able to provide you with the answer that you're looking for. Now, I believe in reduced reading for these kids. Uh, nowadays, because of technology, you can supplement their their learning with uh, videos or audiobooks or podcasts or whatever it is seems to be the most effective way to allow this child to master what it is you're asking them to learn. Uh, I believe that shortened tests are quite valuable as a potential uh, accommodation as well as enhanced study guide. By that I mean maybe you'll have a uh, really well organized study guide that you can provide to the child. Sometimes teachers have found that it's really valuable to provide the study guide to the child earlier, like a week before the test, so that they have a chance to really spend extra time on it in preparation for the actual test. And for many kids, please you know understand that any kind of written work is really kind of just driving them through a very serious choke point because their written work is not consistent with their true capability. So that's where oral testing can serve as a bypass for that. So there's, um, you know, those are only half a dozen of hundreds of accommodations that I'm sure all of you are well aware of. But I think if you take a look at this PDF that we've created for you, you'll find that this is a quick, simple, clean way for you to be able to choose what's reasonable for you in your classroom with your dyslexic kids. So thank you. This is, a, this is an important one, and I'm hoping that uh, you enjoyed it, and I hope that it was of value to you. And of course, as always, please feel free to contact me at drmichaelhart at gmail.com. Thank you.